comprehensive spectrum of services. Um, we're a pretty small organization, so unlike some of the um, sort of free clinics that you might see in this neighborhood like Glide, um, because we serve sort of such a niche community, um, we don't have like lines down the street or anything. It's generally about maybe 20 people in and out throughout the day. Um, our support groups are typically five to 10 people. Our busiest night is Wednesday night, um, but most days we're seeing more like 15 or 20 people. So we were, I'm gonna keep rambling, is that okay? Yes, we're doing so much. Put, which fits in. Um, I started out at 18 as a male hustler. Mm -hmm. And for 21 years, I hooked either um, on the street or at the culvert. And I did that for 21 years. And for 21 and a half years, I've been out of business. Yeah. Um, so I'm well aware of the, in the history, yeah. a lot of the discrimination and the yeah. uh, pain that workers went through. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, there's um, a tremendous amount of discrimination from healthcare providers as well as you know the way our city, the way our city treats our community in general. Things like you know arresting people for having too many condoms on them or something like that. Um, you know, Im imposing these laws where condoms aren't illegal for anybody else, but if they perceive you as being engaged in prostitution then all of a sudden you're not allowed to protect yourself in the same way as everyone else. So we really do believe that sex worker rights are a human rights issue. We also believe that they're very much an LGBT issue. Um, over 70% of the, the people that come through our clinic for services are LGBT. Over a third are trans. Um, so you know we definitely bring like an LGBT rights framework to everything that we do as well. Um, we also work very closely with um, the Transgender, Gender Variant, and Intersex Rights Project, Justice Project, um, that works is a group of um, trans people who are formerly incarcerated, advocating for trans people who are currently incarcerated. So, writing letters, um, you know, having um, doing legal visits, um, connecting people to attorneys who are, you know, housed in the wrong, um, the wrong facilities or something like that. So, that's another aspect of the work that we do. Um, and basically we found out that our building was being sold and was going to be torn down and turned into tech offices um, in July. And since then I have been looking for um, a new facility for us to rent and turn into a healthcare clinic. It's been incredibly bleak out there if you can imagine. Um, and we were really excited when we discovered 234 Eddy Street because it used to be, very recently, a healthcare clinic. It was the Housing and Urban Health Clinic. And so it's already built out to be able to be used, you know, it has a lab area, it has sinks in the correct rooms. Um, it, it's like the perfect home for us. And it's in this neighborhood where so um, many of the people that we serve live and work and exist. And we think that the services that we can offer um, you know, will be beneficial to the people in the neighborhood. So we um, are really hopeful that it works out. We're very close to having a lease. Um, we just went through our Prop I last week. And so now I just wanted to kind of introduce myself to the various different neighborhood groups and hear people's thoughts. My one concern I have is um, we have a prolificity of youth in this neighborhood. And we have right across the street is the Dayton after school program, yeah. which I've been noticing is an in, having an increased influx of Muslim children. Mm -hmm. And the industry, the word that you're talking about, it may be contrary to their religious teachings. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of having a possible conflict. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we have a park with two, day, two children's centers in it. Yeah. And my biggest concern is if you have workers who come dressed for work hanging outside, um, it could be a uh, negative influence on kids hanging outside. So I think it, it can be handled uh, in an appropriate manner just as long as your, the clients there realize 
that there is a large number of children in this neighborhood and to handle themselves accordingly. Yeah, and you know, many of our clients also have children, and we also provide healthcare services to their children. So we can, um, when I say sex workers and their families, we provide services to current former sex workers, their current primary partner, and their adolescent children. Um, we don't have any pediatricians on staff, but we, we can provide adolescent care. So um, despite, you know, the, despite the fact that we are um, a sex positive organization, we are also, I would say, a family friendly. Well, I mean, it's just something that you, th you, you think about. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is I wanted to bring up is um, what do you have outreach into the adolescent community who are sex workers so with the influx yeah. of Larkin Street on Golden Gate? Well, they have their own health clinic. Yeah. Um, are you considering or would you consider possibly partnering with their health clinic um, to provide services for them uh, down here since you, if you get down here, you're going to do both be down here? So um, we have partnered with Larkin in, pre in the past, although we don't have any current collaborations going on right now. Um, we work pretty closely with Lyric, and Lyric actually has, um, Lyric is an LGBT youth organization in the Castro, and they currently have a group called SWAG, which is the Sex Worker Action Group, and that is young people who are sex workers, um, or who have been, and so, um, because we're a peer-based organization, we try and really, um, and we're not youth, most of us. We don't try and um, organize that community, we, but we do support young people who have that experience organizing one another. So when SWAG was initially looking for meeting places, we would let them meet in our community room. We've supported a number of their actions, and we, we do partner with them. Um, we provide services to, again, anyone who's um, 12 years or older. So our services are definitely available to youth, but we tend to see an adult population. I only mentioned Market Street because I'm a co-founder of Market Street. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Oh. Wow. Good project. Wow, that's amazing. Um, In terms of outreach, we do um, street-based and venue-based outreach. So we have teams of outreach workers that you know walk around the Tenderloin, the Mission, the Polk, the Selma and distribute everything from condoms and lube to you know, granola bars and bottled water and clean socks and... Yeah, things like that. And uh, we also go into strip clubs and massage parlors and um, you know, try and make sure that those workers have what they need. Question? Is it, is it only for sex workers or is it open for everybody? So, Almost all of our services are just for current and former sex workers and their families, but um, we do have a needle exchange that's open to everyone. And um, on that day and during those hours, we have access, to, we do distribute food to everyone. Um, our outreach is for everyone, but our in-clinic services are just for the sex worker community. Do they um, have to have a card or something? So, no. <laughs> no. I mean, that, how would you know if the no, person it's, is People a just, sex worker or not? Yeah. There's no way to, to prove, and we don't, um, don't in, interrogate people. We do ask so, everybody. Yeah. Um, we know when people come in, we say, this is a clinic for current former sex workers. This is what that means. You know, it, what is your connection to that? Wow. Okay, if you don't have any connection to that, which sometimes people come in and they say, oh, no, I just heard that you had free HIV testing, but I don't, I didn't realize it was for sex workers. And we'll say, okay, no problem. You know, here's the city clinic. We can give you a referral to services. Um, all of our services are free, and it is, I think, the reason we kind of try and keep it just for the community is that a lot of people that come to our clinic um, might not be out as sex workers to anybody in their life. And so we want to really respect people's privacy and people's confidentiality and keep it a safe space for that community. Uh, for probably the student in here, you do not know how to do this. Okay, I'm now curious about the student person. Yeah. I don't, I've never even known of any of these things that happen to you, and I've been searching for such a problem. That's kind of discrimination? Yeah. yeah, so when we were first, in 1989, when we were thinking, I wasn't there actually. Um, in 1989, 
1999, when the idea of the St. James Infirmary was, the other sex worker health care clinic was coming up, it was started because um, there was uh, this idea in the STD prevention and control section of the Department of Public Health that, that the high syphilis rates in the city were probably because of prostitutes, right? This is like this idea that they had. Um, and so in order to try and test sex workers for syphilis, what they were doing is partnering with um, the police officers and the sheriffs, and they were arresting people that they suspected to be sex workers, and then while they were in jail, it could be Brian awaiting trial, they were forcibly drawn their blood. And so without telling them what it was for, and like that. And um, a group of sex worker activists, including Margot St. James, who's our namesake, sort of rang the alarm on that practice and said, you know, that's a human rights violation, you can't do that. Um, so that's one example. And then we did a survey of about, I think, 350 sex workers in San Francisco, and we asked them questions like, have you ever told your healthcare provider that you're, what you do for work? Um, and if so, what was their reaction? And there was a really high prevalence of people describing a scenario where they would go in reporting a symptom like, I have a sprained ankle. And then once they disclosed, I sprained my ankle working at Broadway Showgirl, they would instead be given STD tests, pregnancy tests, yeah, and they wouldn't be treated for their sprained ankle. You know what I mean? So there was this, um, that kind of stigma was affecting the kind of care that people were getting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, do you have some kind of being able to refer people to domestic violence uh, treat, treat? I mean, you know, yeah. that that would be non-judgmental. Yeah. So this is actually the first year that we have received funding from the Department on the Status of Women mm -hmm. through their Violence Against Women um, funding stream, mm -hmm. and so they have started funding us to do our own. Um, peer advocacy and support for people who are experiencing domestic violence um, or violence from law enforcement or violence from you know people posing as clients, managers, pimps, things like this. And um, some of the programming that we've done with that funding is we created something called a bad date list where if someone has a violent encounter, um, they can write up a description of that person, what happened, their license plate, any details like that, and we collect those reports and we distribute them to other people who might per might possibly be running into that person. So it's kind of like a notification alert system within the community. And then we also partner with um, like Bay Area Women Against Rape, um, you know, La Casa de las Madres. We have relationships with the other um, DV organizations, but um, we also do some of that work ourselves. Thank you. Any other questions? So, go ahead. So, where in the process um, are you within the space? Sure. So, we um, completed our Prop I. We had our Health Commission hearing last week. Um, health Commission voted to approve the relocation, and we are now in the process of getting another draft of the proposed lease. Yeah. So. So when do you think you might be able to have the lease done? Uh, we hope to. It's so hard to say with these things because sometimes they just take a while. Um, we would love to be moving in in the next. We hope to move in in the next thirty to sixty. What do you need the alliance to advocate for? Nothing. We just wanted to come. We, I just wanted to come and introduce myself and meet you all. And I've heard about the great work that the alliance does, but I've never been to a meeting. So, um, yeah. <laughs> never should I What is it? Never should Oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah. So that's it, that's us. Okay, this is, might be going on YouTube. On YouTube? Yes. Oh gosh, I wish I had more coffee before I started. All of, all, of our, all of our meetings are on YouTube. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Should I read these? Do you think there's more people that might use them? Or should I take them? I can try. Okay. Next on the agenda is my part. I was hoping to have somebody here from the police department, but as always, the police department is up in the air of what, whether they can come or not based on service calls. Um, what I can say for public safety is uh, besides Pandora, we're looking at an opening uh, type uh, 21 establishment at 22 4th Street, which is the little bulb out section of the newer building behind the old Navy building across the alleyway from Fox, Fox, from, uh, Fox Hardware on 4th Street. We're also looking at a Type 41 beer wine on sale at 400 Eddy or 301 Leavenworth, depending on which gate they're using. Um, and uh, those are two other issues within the neighborhood that I'm aware of. On public safety. As you know, we just got finished with the Super Bowl, and I have to say the neighborhood went through it rather nicely. Um, we had no issues that I haven't heard of going on in the neighborhood, although the homeless were harassed a lot over here on Ellis Street. Um, but other than that, I had, didn't see any major issues. Okay. Um, as far as land use, this is land use to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, there's a project receiving environmental review for 430 Eddy Street, which is the parking lot between the Jefferson and I think the Kinney or the Fairfax, whichever one is next to it. There's a little sliver of parking lot on Eddy, which winds into a bigger parking lot on Ellis next to the Senator Hotel. That project's going to be environmental review. They want to put up housing there with um, doesn't say how many have uh, I don't have all this in order, so early morning this morning. And also going on on February 25th is a public hearing before the Planning Commission for 988 Harrison which is a conditional use authorization and large project authorization in the downtown plan to convert a uh, auto service station or a gas station to people with cars um, into, a hundred, into a building for 100 dwelling units and 73 underground parking spaces. Something I have noticed within the past two years, we, are, we have lost by plans like this. Every gas station, in District 6. At the rate things are going, there will be no gas stations west, or excuse me, no gas stations east of Van Ness that will all be housing. And all these housing have places for cars. But my concern is where are they going to get gasoline? I mean, you've got to have a place to have it. And something else I've noticed that Jane Kim's office is refusing to comment on is that the loss of small business in District 6 is absolutely horrific, being replaced by housing. We're losing businesses that have been around for 50 or 60 years to make way for new housing in this housing market. My two concerns. We also have building permit application for 1335 Folsom, which is turning a light industrial building into uh, residential and uh, commercial. It will be an SRO hotel with 48 housing units in it. Uh, there's a uh, hearing before the Planning Commission and the Zoning Administrator to convert a existing commercial building into an 80 foot tall mixed use housing development with 35 dwelling units. I have a pre-application notice, which is a part of the planning process before they submit a building application. This one is for 719 Market in Little Saigon. They want to, they want to tear down a one-story commercial building and build a residential uh, building, an eight-story building with 42 dwelling units, 28 one-bedrooms, and 14 two-bedrooms. 
most of these are market rate with 12% affordable housing 